I'm Bob Margo. I'm the chair of the Department of Economics at BU. I want to welcome you to what is uh, one, in fact, is our intellectual and social highlight of the academic year, which is the annual Robert Rosenthal Memorial Lecture. The lecture honors the memory of Bob Rosenthal, a member of our faculty who died unexpectedly at age 57 on February 27, 2002. Bob was one of the great economic theorists of post-war economics, responsible for many fundamental and profound insights in game theory and other aspects of theoretical economics. I never had the personal pleasure of having Bob as a colleague, but as it happens, I did know him because we served together on the National Science Foundation review panel in economics. I witnessed firsthand how tough and forceful a critic he was, how extraordinarily high his standards were, and this was on a committee where the average member is notorious for being extremely difficult. At the same time, it was also clear that he was generous with his advice on how to improve a piece of research, and his criticism was never personal or the form of blood sport that it often is in economics, but served to elevate the work because he was committed to economics as a scholarly endeavor and as a practical tool for understanding the world. The lecture is made possible by the generosity of his family and many friends. So my task today is just to introduce the faculty member who will introduce our speaker. Uh, I'm going to introduce the introducer. That's Andy Newman. Andy received his PhD in economics in 1989. Our speaker happens to have been a member of his dissertation committee. Prior to arriving at BU, Andy taught at Northwestern, Columbia, Yale, and at UCL. He's an associated fellow of eCares in Belgium, a research fellow of CEPR in London, and an associate editor of the Journal of Development Economics and the Berkeley Electronic Journal of Theoretical Economics. He has an international reputation for his contributions to the economic theory of development and the economics of organizations. His publications include many path-breaking papers in the Journal of Political Economy, the Review of Economic Studies, Econometrica, and the Journal of Economic Theory. And fortunately for me, next year, he will be the interim director of the Department's Institute for Economic Development, Andy Newman. Thanks, Bob. Um, it's sort of conventional in, in forums like this uh, for the introductory speaker to embarrass the guest uh, by listing his accomplishments, the impressive list of widely cited and measurably influential uh, papers, the positions he's held at top universities and other academic institutions around the world, the pr lists of pr prestigious invited lecturers, Oh, and then this small token that was given to him by the Bank of Sweden a few years back. Um, but most of you guys have laptops and iPods and stuff like that, so you can look it up on the Internet and you'll see the long list uh, described. So I just want to say a few things about what it was like uh, to be a student, because one of Eric's uh, accomplishments is the long list of stellar students uh, and less stellar students uh, <laughs> that uh, he's produced over the years, uh, including at least one who spoke in this series uh, a couple of years ago. Um, so Eric would never tell you what to work on, um, and he was uh, incredibly generous with his time, even if what you were working on was not necessarily terribly closely related to what he was working on, although he's interested in almost everything, so uh, it was hard to find topics that he, that he was really bored with. Um, but louder. louder, okay. Um, but uh, he had several traits which his students all shared and talked about. Um, one of them was the famous blink, and the way this would work is you would go in having thought your head off for the last week about something that you were very excited about. You begin to explain it to them. And then the brow would raise slightly. And then a blink would start like this. And your heart would sink. 
because you knew that there was a logical flaw, a fatal logical flaw in whatever it was you were saying, and you would have to go back and start over again. Um, but this, I think, tended to produce much better dissertations than would otherwise have happened. So maybe we need, all need to blink a bit more um, in our advisory roles. Um, he was extremely kind and generous to students in other ways. Uh, he, some of you may not know this, because I notice it doesn't say this on the internet, but uh, Eric is both an accomplished musician and a gourmet cook. And upon completion of your dissertation, he would invite you to his house and he would cook for you, um, you and the other members of the committee and maybe a couple of friends. And occasionally, well, I didn't see this, but a rumor has that occasionally he would play for you his clarinet. Um, he also influenced us in ways, I think his research, a lot of his research has influenced us in ways that we're not really aware of. Uh, a lot of the tools we use in workaday economic theory are things that Eric helped develop and we don't necessarily know that. And he also would subliminally influence us uh, in other ways. Uh, I remember distinctly about 10 years ago going to a seminar at MIT and there were about six or seven of his former students in the audience. Um, and Eric uh, used to wear sweater vests all the time. Um, you looked around the room and there were six or seven students, they were all wearing sweater vests <laughs> like this. Uh, but I see now I'm going to have to get a tie. <laughs> In any case, um, that's Eric. It was, uh, it was a pleasure to be his student. It's a pleasure to continue to be his colleague and, and his friend. And so now I give you uh, a mentor, uh, a musician, a gourmet cook, and a Nobel laureate, Eric Maskin. Well, thank you, Andy. Uh, I suppose that that was embarrassing, <laughs> uh, but it was embarrassing in a very nice way. So I, I very much appreciate the introduction. And I also very much appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to, to give the Robert Rosenthal Memorial Lecture. It's not only a great honor, uh, but it has particular meaning for me because uh, Bob and I were uh, old and, and, and good friends. Uh, I, I met him for the first time many years ago. Uh, I got to know him well because we both used to, uh, to hang out in what was the, the most dangerous place in the world, uh, the Stanford Economics Department. Uh, it was dangerous because uh, we would go for the summer seminars there, which were uh, a battle zone. Uh, we'd arrive at the beginning of the summer full of enthusiasm and energy and by the end, we would be bloody, uh, dejected. Uh, we would be licking our wounds. Uh, and for me, Bob was the island of tranquility in a roiling sea. Because uh, as, as Bob Margot said, uh, Although Bob had as sharp a mind as anyone and could find the faults with any line of argument, if there were any, uh, he used his uh, judgment to improve a piece of work, not to tear it down. And I saw him in action in that way on many occasions uh, at Stanford. He, he became uh, a role model for me, and I've, I've tried to live up to the, uh, 
to the standard that, that he set. Now, I don't know what he would have said about the particular piece of work I'm going to be talking about today. I, I hope, I, I hope uh, he wouldn't find too many flaws in it. But I, I do think that it uh, uh, is in the Rosenthal tradition. Uh, as as uh, Bob Margot said, uh, Bob Rosenthal was, was a pioneer in uh, applying, uh, developing and then applying game theory to uh, important topics in economics and the other social sciences. And this, this uh, will be an application of game theory to uh, voting theory. Uh, it's uh, based on some work, some rather recent work that I've been doing with, uh, with Partha Dasgupta. Well, let me begin uh, by setting the scene. A voting rule is an example of a more general kind of uh, concept, uh, a social choice function. Uh, but a, a voting rule in particular is simply a method for electing a candidate, choosing a candidate. Uh, on the basis of voters' preferences for candidates. And there have been many examples of voting rules used in practice and also considered in the theoretical literature. Let me just mention a few. Uh, probably the, the most widespread voting rule of all, not a particularly good voting rule, but a, but a one in widespread use is uh, what uh, is called plurality rule, or in Britain it's often called first past the post. Uh, and it's the rule in which we look at voters' top choices, and only their top choices, and we simply elect the candidate, the alternative, who is the top choice of mo more voters than any other, even if this falls short of a majority. Uh, another famous voting rule, uh, going back to the Marquis de Condorcet in the 18th century, if not further, is majority rule, or to be more accurate, simple majority rule, uh, in which now we have to look at more information uh, from voters. We have to look at their rankings, and, and we choose as the winner the candidate, the alternative, who, according to those rankings, would beat each other candidates by a majority, uh, assuming that there, that there is such a candidate. Uh, then there is runoff voting. Uh, this is used in many countries. In particular, it's used to elect presidents in France, in Brazil, in, in uh, many other places as well. Uh, and in this case, we first look to see uh, whether the first place choices of voters uh, attain a majority. If, if, there's, no, if there's no candidate uh, who uh, passes that hurdle, who, who is ranked first by a majority of voters, then we go to a runoff uh, and we take the top two candidates in terms of, of votes. They go into the runoff and whichever one wins in the runoff is the overall winner. Another voting rule which uh, deserves mention is the one proposed by uh, Condorcet's arch rival in uh, the French Academy of Sciences uh, of the uh, late 18th century. Uh, the, the voting rule proposed by Jean-Charles Bourdas, uh, 
commonly called rank order voting. Uh, and the way that works is uh, voters submit their rankings. And every time a candidate is ranked first, uh, he or she gets one point, two points every time he or she is ranked second, and so on. And then we just add up a candidate's points over, over the voters. And the winner is the candidate with the lowest point total, because low points correspond to high ranking. Then finally, let me designate as a voting rule what we might call the, the utilitarian principle. Uh, we don't normally think of this as a voting rule, but the, in, in principle it is. Uh, we can have voters submit their utility functions and perhaps normalized uh, in some way. Uh, and we look for the alternative that maximizes the sum of utilities. That would be uh, perhaps uh, the economists' uh, favorite voting rule if there weren't some difficulties with this principle, which uh, I will be getting to in the course of the talk. Well, here I've mentioned uh, just five voting rules, uh, but I could go on to mention many others. Of course, in principle, there's an infinity of possible voting rules, and a natural question to ask is, how do we go about deciding which one to actually use in practice? Well, the, the way that voting theorists normally try to answer this question is to break the problem down. Uh, we, the voting rule that we want to adopt should depend on what we want a voting rule to deliver. And the way that we specify what a voting rule should deliver is through various axioms or criteria that we would want the voting rule to satisfy. So one way of answering the question which voting rule to adopt is to specify some axioms and then see which rule or rules come closest to, to meeting these axioms. Now, one important criterion, and, and it's one that I will give some attention to today, is what, what we might call non-manipulability. Uh, this is the idea that when voters submit their rankings or their utility functions, that they should not have an incentive to report rankings which are untruthful. They, they should not have an incentive to rank X above Y if actually they prefer Y above X. In other words, they should not have the incentive to vote strategically. Now, why, why should we care about non-manipulability? Why is it so prominent in the voting literature? Uh, there are actually numerous reasons. I'm, I'm going to concentrate on, on just two of them. Uh, the first is that if voters are distorting their rankings, if they are manipulating, then in the end we're not actually implementing the voting rule that we were intending to implement. We're implementing something else. If you distort the inputs, you're also going to distort the outputs. And perhaps the intended voting rule satisfies lots of axioms that you might like, but there is not necessarily any reason why the distorted voting rule will satisfy those axioms. So uh, on those grounds alone, uh, non-manipulability uh, is uh, an important goal. But I think that th th there's, there's an issue which from a practical point of view, uh, from the 
point of view of actual elections might be even more important, which is that highly manipulable voting rules place a, an extra burden on the voters themselves. When you're a citizen participating in an election, it's a lot of work just figuring out what your own preferences are, what your own ranking is. You have to do some homework. You have to read up on the candidates. You have to know where they stand on the issues. Uh, being a citizen is, is a non-trivial task. If on top of that, you have to figure out what other voters' rankings are because you have to maximize when submitting your own ranking against them, that's what strategic voting is, your decision problem is at least an order of magnitude, probably several orders of magnitude, more complicated. And we know from some classic cases where uh, st strategic voting occurred that voters often don't get this more complicated decision problem right. So, so for their sake, it's worthwhile to strive for non-manipulability. Unfortunately, there, there's a well-known uh, negative result on the question of non-manipulability. Uh, many of you, probably most of you in the audience, know this result. It's the gibbard satterthwaite theorem, which says that if there are th three or more candidates, then there's no voting rule that is always non-manipulable, except for rules which place all the power in the hands of a single person, in, in, in the hands of a dictator, which is undesirable for, for other reasons. It's, it's highly uh, undemocratic. Now, I'd like to take the position that the gibbard satterthwaite result, although it's clearly an important result, is too negative. Uh, and that's because when we talk about manipulability, Gibbard Satterthwaite insists that a voting rule should never be manipulable. And yet, in practice, there may be circumstances where a voting rule is manipulable, but they may not be very likely circumstances, and so we might not worry about them very much. So it seems to, to me, it seems to me, and, and Partha Dasgupta, uh, who's been collaborating with me, uh, that uh, the, the natural question to ask after Gibbard Satterthwaite, or a natural question, is which voting rules come closest to satisfying non-manipulability, which are non-manipulable most often. And that is the kind of question uh, that we are trying to answer uh, in this work. So, so that's, that's the introduction. Uh, and from here on out, I will uh, set up the model and, and try to answer the question. Now, uh, I will, um, it, it's, it's possible that there are some non-economists in the audience. I was told that there could be. Uh, uh, I'm going to try to present this in a way that uh, is comprehensible to, to, non to people who haven't seen any voting theory literature at all before, uh, but uh, please feel free if, if something I've said is incomprehensible to, to let me know. Uh, I'd be happy to clarify anything I say. Now, the, 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 the slides themselves will be, 
at times be a, a little bit technical, but you can ignore those if, if the technicalities don't mean anything to you. So, so let me set the scene, uh, set up the model. Uh, we'll start with a set of uh, social alternatives, a, a set of conceivable candidates. Now, the, these are not the candidates who are necessarily going to be in the actual election, but they're all the, the candidates who could conceivably be in the election. Uh, and we'll suppose that this is a, a finite set that, that simplifies things technically. Uh, now, there's, one, there's going to be one non-standard feature of uh, the model that I'm setting up. In, in all other respects, it's completely conventional. The one non-standard feature, and, and uh, I'll explain why we introduced this feature in a, in a couple of minutes, uh, the, the one non-standard feature is that we're, we're going to assume that there's a very large number of voters, a continuum of voters. Uh, so the typical voter will be a point on, on a continuum. We can think of the continuum as being between zero and one. Uh, and for our purposes, a voter a voter I is adequately described by his or her utility function over the conceivable candidate. So a utility function just assigns a utility to each candidate and higher numbers correspond to more preferred candidates. And here I'm going to again make a restriction. Uh, for those of you who have worked on voting theory or social choice theory more generally, uh, you'll know that uh, the possibility of indifference, of a, of a voter being exactly indifferent between two candidates, can be a real headache. Uh, and it, not a particularly illuminating headache either. It, it, it's, it's a pain to work with, and it doesn't really add all that much to our insight. I'm just going to rule out indifference by assuming that utility functions are strict. That just means that uh, uh, voters are, uh, never assign exactly the same utility to two different candidates. And we can describe the entire society, the entire electorate, by uh, what's called a profile of utility functions. This is a specification of each individual citizen's utility function. Well, given that, a voting rule, uh, which, I, as I said, is, is just uh, uh, an example of, uh, of a social choice function is a way of going from profiles and from ballots, I'll, I'll say what a ballot is in a minute, to, um, to a winner. So uh, I said before that the set of all conceivable candidates might be uh, much bigger than the set of candidates who actually participate in the election. The, 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 the set of candidates who actually participate is the ballot. Uh, and that's, uh, in, in my notation on the slide, subset Y. So for each profile and for each ballot of potential candidates, the voting rule selects a winner, uh, which you can think of as the, uh, as the optimal alternative if you're, if you're uh, looking, at a, uh, looking at this from a more general social choice theory perspective. Uh, now, actually, what I've said isn't quite right, uh, because I've 
been assuming that for the voting rule, uh, given a ballot and given a profile that there is a clearly identified winner. But for all of the voting rules that I mentioned in my introduction, um, there isn't always a clearly defined winner. There could be a tie. So f f with plurality rule, for example, it's possible that there could be two alternatives that uh, are both ranked first by equally many voters. Well, that's where the continuum comes in. Uh, if there is a large number of voters, in particular if there's a, a continuum of voters, the probability of an exact tie is not very high. In fact, uh, with, with uh, a continuum, it, it's probability zero. So uh, the, the, the technical way of putting this is to say that with the continuum, a tie is non-generic. And that's what we will uh, define uh, a voting rule to be, a rule which for a generic profile, a, prob uh, a probability one profile, does not give rise to a tie. Uh, the, it, it, the voting rule identifies a unique winner. OK, so now I've set things up uh, sufficiently so that all of the voting rules that I defined somewhat informally in the introduction can be defined more precisely. So plurality rule. Uh, looks like this. And again, th those of you who uh, don't want to deal with technicalities can just ignore this. But uh, uh, for, for those of you who are interested, uh, think of, of mu here. Mu, uh, formally, mu is, is, uh, is a measure, like Lebesgue measure. But Think of mu as, as uh, the way of um, uh, measuring the proportion of voters uh, in a, uh, who constitute a particular set. So, uh, <coughs> I wonder if there if there's a, a laser pointer around. Does anyone know whether such a thing? Well, uh, it doesn't matter. The, uh, so mu appears twice in that expression. Uh, on the top line, uh, we're looking at the set of voters who uh, rank A top, who, who, who put A at the top of their list. Uh, and on the second line, we're looking at the set of voters who put A prime at the top of their list. Oh, great. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Very unusual. The middle button. Yeah. Uh, so this is the, uh, this is the set of, the, the, this is the set of voters who uh, rank A prime first. Uh, and according to plurality rule, uh, candidate A is the winner if the proportion of voters who rank A first is uh, bigger than the proportion who rank any other alternative A prime first for any A prime. So that, that's a uh, uh, laborious but more precise way of defining uh, plurality rule. I won't uh, bore you with the uh, corresponding definitions for the other uh, voting rules I mentioned. But can, the, those definitions can easily be provided. Uh, what I do want to discuss uh, are the axioms, the uh, criteria that we want 
our voting rules to satisfy. And, and here again, I'm going to uh, be highly conventional. I'm not going to introduce any new axioms. These are all going to be familiar axioms to people who know the voting literature. The only novelty in this paper uh, is that, as I mentioned in the introduction, we are not necessarily going to insist that all of the axioms always be satisfied. We're, we want to see uh, what happens when we look at the possibility that sometimes they're not satisfied. Well, which axioms uh, are, are we going to uh, require? Uh, the first is uh, the Pareto property, sometimes called the consensus principle, and, and it's just the requirement that if everybody, if, if all voters think that candidate X is better than candidate Y, and if candidate X is actually on the ballot, then it would be uh, a travesty. <laughs> if Y were elected. How, how could we elect Y if everybody thinks X is better and X is actually available? Uh, so so uh, Pareto property seems uh, a, uh, uh, a fundamental uh, property from the standpoint of any democratic system, as I, as I think is the, is the next property, which uh, goes under the name of anonymity, and, and formally what it says is if we take a profile and now we give I's ranking to voter J and we give J's ranking to voter K, in other words, we permute all of the rankings, but we uh, keep the distribution of rankings the same as before, we just change the names of the people who have them, that shouldn't change the outcome. Uh, because ultimately what matters in, the, in an election is, is what the votes are, not who, who cast those votes. Uh, it's the, the one person, one vote principle, and that, and that seems also quite fundamental uh, in, in democracies, although unfortunately it's, it's sometimes violated by actual voting rules. Uh, the, in this country, uh, 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 particularly uh, obvious example is the electoral college method of electing presidents. That violates anonymity. It matters which state you're from. Well, just as anonymity treats all voters equally, the next property, neutrality, says that we should treat all candidates equally. That is, if we permute the names of the candidates, if we give candidate X's name to candidate Y, and we give Y's name to candidate Z, and so on, uh, then we should permute the name of the winner in the same way. So na names, again, should not matter. Now, not surprisingly, all the voting rules that I've talked about satisfy uh, these three principles. The, 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 these three principles uh, are so obvious that it would be hard to come up with reasonable voting rules, perhaps the Electoral College accepted, if you consider that to be reasonable, uh, that would uh, that would violate any of these principles. Now, that, that's not true of the next axiom, not as true. Uh, this next axiom is far and away the most controversial. And for that reason, at the, uh, a bit later on, I'm going to drop it. But I, I want to. Uh, consider first what happens when we impose this controversial axiom because it, it actually um, has a strong uh, justification, a strong rationale. 
Uh, and it also has a very good pedigree because it was uh, proposed more or less simultaneously uh, in somewhat different forms by uh, Kenneth Arrow and John Nash. And it's what uh, they both called uh, independence of irrelevant alternatives. In, in, in this setting, it's independence of irrelevant candidates. Um, and it says, I'm in, and I'm going to use the Nash formulation here, but I could have used the Arrow formulation. It says that if, um, if we hold an election and X is the winner, and now we throw off the ballot some of the non-winners, then uh, we should still have the same winner because if X w w was better than a bunch of other candidates and we simply get rid of some of those other candidates, X should still be better than the ones left. So that's, uh, that's what the axiom says. Uh, and uh, perhaps the most compelling justification for this axiom uh, comes from electoral, actual electoral experiences in, in many countries, including uh, the US, uh, including uh, France. Uh, those of you uh, who are old enough, I think most of you are old enough to remember uh, the 2000 uh, U.S. presidential election uh, will probably remember that in addition to the two main candidates uh, in, in that election who were George W. Bush, who, who actually won, and Al Gore, uh, who sort of won, uh, uh, there was a third candidate, uh, Ralph Nader. And uh, in that election, uh, Everything came down to the state of Florida. Uh, that is, if Bush won Florida, he would be president. If Gore won Florida, he would be president. Uh, and it turned out that uh, the vote totals between them were exceedingly small. Now, there was a lot of controversy, controversy about how ballots should be counted, uh, how votes should be counted. Uh, but at least according to the official tally, uh, Bush won by fewer than 600 votes out, out of uh, over 5 million uh, cast. Uh, the interesting thing, though, from the standpoint of voting theory, uh, was that uh, nearly 100,000 voters voted for Nader. And the, the reason why that's interesting is that we have uh, a great deal of evidence suggesting that most of those voters, uh, Nader voters, uh, would have voted, if they had voted at all, uh, for Gore had Nader not been on the ballot. Uh, in which case, not only would Gore have won the election, but he would have won the election quite comfortably, even in Florida. He would have won by tens of thousands of votes. Uh, so in effect, Nader, who was an irrelevant candidate, he had no chance of winning himself, changed the outcome of the election. Uh, and uh, for those of you who, who know your electoral history, this is not a rare event in American politics. It's not a rare event in French politics. Uh, independence of irrelevant alternatives rules out this kind of effect where the presence of an irrelevant candidate on the ballot changes the outcome of the election. So that, that's, that's the argument in its favor. Now, one uh, nice feature of majority rule and utilitarianism is that they satisfy uh, independence. Uh, majority rule satisfies independence because if candidate 
X beats the other candidates, e each other candidate by a majority, and we, we now eliminate some of those other candidates, X still beats the remaining candidates by a majority. Uh, utilitarianism uh, satisfies uh, independence because if X maximizes the sum of utilities compared with other candidates and we now get rid of the other candidates, X still maximizes the sum of utilities among the remainder. Uh, but, the, but the other voting rules I've mentioned all violates independence. Uh, uh, in particular, uh, well I've just described how, wh why plurality rule violates independence because Florida used plurality rule uh, and Nader changed the outcome there. But I could, so I'm not going to go through this example, uh, but uh, uh, rank order voting, uh, the, 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 the method proposed by Borda also uh, violates uh, independence. Uh, here's a little example where that happens. So, so independence does give us some cutting power, unlike the axioms that I uh, mentioned before, Pareto, anonymity, and neutrality. And now we come to the axiom that I started with, uh, which is non-manipulability. Now, non-manipulability says uh, that uh, group I'm going to look at blocks of voters rather than, than single voters. Single voters can't make a difference if there's a big uh, electorate, but blocks of voters can. Uh, and w we'll say that uh, a voting rule is non-manipulable if whenever a block of voters, a coalition of voters, see changes their submitted utility functions and this leads to a, uh, a different outcome. Say, say if, they didn't sh if they didn't distort their utility functions we get X, but if they do distort their utility functions we get X prime then there has to be someone in the coalition who doesn't gain from that distortion. Otherwise, the coalition would want to distort. So that's, that's non-manipulability. Uh, and that's all the axioms that I'm going to talk about. Um, unfortunately, um, uh, as I said, uh, the Gibbard Satterthwaite result or a, a version of Gibbard Satterthwaite uh, 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 adapted to these cir circumstances says there is no voting rule that satisfies all uh, of the axioms that I've talked about, Pareto, anonymity, neutrality, independence, uh, and uh, non-manipulability, uh, and the, the, the proof is very similar to the, to the standard theorem. But as I was uh, suggesting, uh, we shouldn't stop there. This, the, the, that's an entirely negative result, and uh, it, it's of interest to see uh, what happens if we um, don't require the axioms uh, always to apply because uh, if only because uh, some ranking, some utility functions uh, uh, are probably pretty unlikely. So, let me um, talk about majority rule uh, for a moment. Uh, ma <coughs> majority rule, it turns out, 
satisfies all five axioms, all five properties, provided that we can rule out uh, preferences uh, where there uh, uh, are Condorcet cycles. Now, uh, Here is, a, uh, here is a Condorcet cycle. Uh, it's the case where uh, there's some people who prefer x to y to z, other people who prefer y to z to x, and a third group who prefers z to x to y. The problem with the Condorcet cycle for, uh, for majority rule, for the Condorcet method, is that there's now no majority winner. Uh, a, a majority uh, prefer x to y, uh, a majority prefer y to z, but a majority prefer z to x. Uh, but uh, it's been known uh, for many years, uh, this was due to uh, the to Duncan Black back in the 1940s that uh, when preferences, for example, are single peaked, as they often will tend to be in, in actual elections, uh, majority rule then does satisfy uh, uh, all the axioms because majority rule now is well defined. We, 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 we have a, uh, a, a well-defined winner. Now, uh, probably most of you have been exposed to the idea of single peakness, but let, let me uh, quickly review that. Uh, so in the 2000 <coughs> presidential election here, uh, among the three candidates, Nader, Gore, and Bush, Nader would be viewed as the left-wing candidate. Bush would be viewed as the right-wing candidate. Uh, Gore was somewhere in between, more to the left than to the right. Uh, all that single peakness says is that it's not very likely that many voters had the preference Bush first, then Nader, then Gore or Nader first, then Bush, then Gore, uh, because that would involve uh, liking one extreme the best, the other extreme the second best, and the, and the, the guy in the middle third. That, now, probably there were some voters who had those preferences. Uh, there are some voters who have any preferences. But the, the point is that there probably weren't that many. In fact. We've got good evidence to suggest that there weren't that many, uh, in which case majority rule works just fine. Uh, now, ac actually, there are other conditions under which majority rule uh, works fine, uh, but I won't get into those now. Let me just say that uh, as a way of dealing with likely versus unlikely preferences, we can define a voting rule to work well on a particular class of preferences if it satisfies those, uh, if, if it satisfies our five axioms when utility functions are limited to that domain of preferences, that cl class of preferences. So, uh, uh, the Condorcet voting rule, majority rule, uh, works well, for example, when preferences are, are single peaked. Uh, and now we come to the first uh, result that I want to talk about, uh, which is, um, which says uh, the following, and, and it, it's a, a two-part result. Take, um, Take any voting rule at all, F, 
And suppose that it works well for a particular domain. So it satisfies our five axioms on that domain. Then majority rule must also work well on that domain. Furthermore, and this is the, the second part, uh, let's suppose that majority rule works well on a particular domain and that there is some profile where majority rule differs from the voting rule that we started with. Then there must exist a domain where majority rule works well and the other voting rule does not. Basically what this says at, is that there's a, there's a clear-cut sense in which majority rule dominates, in a point-wise sense, any other voting rule. If the other voting rule works well, then majority rule works well in, in those same circumstances. And furthermore, there will be cases where majority rule works well and the other voting rule does not. So it, it's, it, it's a strict domination of majority rule over any other voting rule which is not itself majority, majority rule. Now, uh, I'm not going to bother with the proof. Um, in fact, uh, the proof of this result is essentially an immediate application of a paper that Partha and I uh, published a, uh, a couple of years ago uh, in which we didn't look at non-manipulability, uh, which is the topic, main topic of this paper. We, we looked at the other axioms, but it turns out that if you add non-manipulability to the other axioms, the same, the same result goes through. And so, um, no, I'm, I'm, I, I really don't want to bother with the details, but I hope you all read the details in, in that paper. <laughs> um, what I do want to talk about, and, and this will conclude my, my talk, is uh, what happens if we drop independence. Now, I tried to give you a fairly compelling story, the, the Ralph Nader story, uh, for why uh, independence might be a good idea. Nevertheless, uh, it's not disputable that independence has gen generated the most controversy in the voting literature. Uh, and so, uh, for intellectual reasons, if, if no other, it's of interest to see what happens when we drop independence uh, and uh, just impose the uh, remaining requirements, Pareto, anonymity, neutrality, and non-manipulability. Now, unfortunately, um, if we insist that these axioms always be satisfied, we run into the, exactly the same impossibility as before. And this, once again, is the Gibbard satterthwaite theorem. So uh, once again, the, we think that the natural thing to do is to look at restricted domains of preferences, not to allow all possible preferences, but to look at restricted classes. Now, I already used the term working well for the previous result. Now we'll say that a voting rule works nicely for a particular domain if it satisfies the remaining axioms, Pareto, anonymity, neutrality, non-manipulability on that domain. Uh, and now we get uh, theorem two. Uh, which, as you'll see, uh, bears a strong resemblance to theorem one, but there's an interesting twist. Um, so now, 
if a voting rule works nicely for a particular domain, then either majority rule, either Condorcet, or rank order voting, the, the board account, or both, also uh, works nicely on that domain. Furthermore, um, if it's, um, if it's, say, the uh, majority rule that works nicely, then if there exists a profile where majority rule differs from the original voting rule, we can find another domain where majority rule works nicely, but the other voting rule doesn't. Now, I, I ex express this in terms of majority rule, but the same thing applies to Borda if it's Borda which worked nicely in the first instance. In other words, now instead of a single voting rule dominating all others, it's a pair of voting rules, Condorcet and Borda together. Um, and there's a good, there, there, there's, there's a very intuitive reason for, for why the two work together so nicely. As I, as I mentioned before, um, Condorcet works nicely as long as we can rule out Condorcet cycles, as long as we can rule out the presence of uh, three uh, preferences, X, Y, Z, Y, Z, X, Z, X, Y, it turns out that the board account, rank order voting, works nicely precisely when we do have Condorcet cycles. Uh, that's, that's when it comes into its own. Uh, and so the two, the, the, the two voting rules uh, complement each other. Uh, we, we get uh, Condorcet to work well when we can rule out uh, Condorcet cycles. We can get Border to work well uh, when we do have a Condorcet cycle. Uh, now, the reason uh, the reason why I I think this is uh, Satisfying uh, from an, from a uh, from a historical point of view is that, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Condorcet and Borda were arch enemies. Uh, Condorcet was promoting majority rule. Borda was pr promoting rank order voting. These also happen to be the two voting rules which have the longest legacy in the, in the voting literature. What, the, what I would like to interpret theorem two as saying is that there's a good reason why these two voting rules have survived so long why they have been so intensively studied, which is that despite their enmity, uh, Condorcet and Borda were both right. And with that observation, let me thank you for listening to me. We have time for questions or comments. Someone has to break the ice. It's a well-known theorem that there's a, always a bigger gap before the first question. Okay, Larry. I'll do this because I can ask a dumb question and people will feel relaxed. <laughs> so does this mean we should have uh, you know, rules that would flip from one to another? Uh, uh, yeah. yeah 
from Condorcet, you know, from majority to right, right order? Th this, th this gives us a theoretical justification for something else. I, I mentioned Duncan Black in connection with single peak voting earlier on. It turns out that, that Duncan Black proposed something called Black's Rule, which said that when holding a, an election, you should look to see if there's a candidate who, no, you don't look for a cycle. You look for a, a candidate who beats all of the others by a majority. Uh, if one exists, that's great. That's the winner. If, if there is, but if, if there isn't such a candidate, which will happen because there's a cycle, then we use rank order voting, uh, the, the board accounts. And I'm happy to say <laughs> that uh, after advising the AEA on this, uh, they, came, they, they agreed uh, with me that this is the method that should be used for electing um, distinguished fellows of the, of the AA. So, so uh, not only um, is this a nice theoretical solution, um, it's even being used in practice, <laughs> at least to a limited degree. <laughs> Thanks. The, the, the practical application makes me think, do you have any thoughts about what happens when you have multi-person constituencies? Okay, so you're not electing one person, yeah. but you're electing right. multiple uh, uh, people. It's, it's very important for, um, for the theorems that I've stated uh, that there be a single winner. Uh, the problem of uh, electing an entire legislature when using something like uh, uh, proportional rule uh, is theoretically much more complicated. It's a problem we're working on. Uh, but I don't have I don't have the counterparts of theorem one and theorem two to report yet. Uh, I th I think that there will be such counterparts. That is, uh, for theorem one, if you're if if you if you're electing multiple people to office, you will want to first elect the person who. Uh, uh, is the overall majority winner. Taking her out, you next elect the person who is the majority winner among the remaining candidates and, and, and so on, but that's just a conjecture. On, on, on Kevin's question, can't you just apply the same result by saying that you vote on the entire Parliament, the entire oh, council. Sure. You can, you know, vote on the entire list of members, and then no, it's that's you right. Apply so, so, so yes, a, 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 a theoretical, uh, a, a theoretical trick for immediately extending these results is to say that an alternative is the election of everybody. Uh, So an alternative now is the specification of who all the winners are. Uh, that's, that's true. Uh, the problem is that in practice, uh, having people rank all alternatives now becomes uh, uh, ridiculous. Uh, it, it, even the problem of having people rank single candidates in, say, a nine-candidate election is non-trivial. Now, one way you can get around that is by, by telling voters they don't have to rank all candidates. They can rank as many as they like, uh, and then the others will be treated as tied down at the bottom. The problem is that, that 
if, if an alternative now is uh, the election of all winners, uh, 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 voters will not be indifferent uh, among many of those alternatives and therefore will be compelled to give very long rankings. Uh, and so we, we, don't, we don't consider that, although it's a theoretical fix, it, it, we don't consider that to be practically viable. Drop the, for the second result, you dropped the independence of irrelevant alternatives. Right. But suppose you were to retain it and drop the non-manipulability requirement as an yes. alternative. Then you, I guess you're back to the arrow question, because arrow I yeah. was not that, looking right. at non-manipulability. So do you have any results for that? Context? We do. That, that, that was actually the, the earlier paper that Partha and I published. So, so in, the, in the first paper, we, we had all of the axioms except non-manipulability. And there it turned out that, that it's the same as theorem one. Uh, majority rule uh, dominates all others. Uh, and in, uh, so in particular, majority rule dominates rank order voting because rank order voting violates independence uh, in, a, in a very serious way, as anyone who's played around with it uh, can see, whereas majority rule doesn't. So uh, once, we, once we drop independence, that brings up rank order voting a bit. Uh, Michael. So suppose you're electing several candidates, and suppose half the voters have one linear ordering of who they prefer, and the other half have the opposite. Yeah. Maybe a little bit less have the opposite. Will, will the half? Will the, will the, I don't know whether this is on. <laughs> but my voice is loud. Will the half of the voters that are a little more than the majority determine all the winners? If you do the Condorcet voting, the majority voting. So, you know, yeah, half prefer, that's right. half plus epsilon prefer A, B, C, D, that's and right. the other half prefers D. That's right. Uh, well, I, f first of all, I, I, it was only, a, a conjecture that Condorcet would come out uh, in the same way once we looked at multiple winner uh, elections. But if if it did come out ahead, then 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 that's right. Uh, that that same majority uh, that determined the top uh, winner <coughs> would determine all of the others. Uh, would determine all the others as well. And you might be concerned about that. That might be the tyranny of the majority, in which case that would say that for multi-winner elections, we want to have more than just these axioms. We, we might also want to rule out tyrannies of that, of that sort. So one, uh, another reason why it's a more complicated problem. So um, when you say the the the, strat the mechanism you suggested, you do first Condorcet, and then you pass to Borda. But that that mechanism entire is it satisfies all the axioms, or at the Condorcet stage, I might anticipate something that happens in the Borda oh, stage, sorry, and then it, I, it, it, I cheat. No, there's no mechanism that satisfies all the axioms. Not that, even this that, that's, one. That's not even this way. That's Gibbard Satterthwaite. Mm -hmm. uh, however. It will, in, in, the, in the sense of theorem two, it will come closer to satisfying the axioms, all the axioms, in the sense that it will satisfy all the axioms on more domains than any other. But it, it, it does, so there's not like a, an incentive today to manipulate the vote in, because I figure out that tomorrow we will pass to the board the voting oh, and maybe yeah, the, I don't the, 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 There is. There, uh, I mean, that, that could happen. That, that kind of manipulation might pay. Uh, that is, you, you, uh, you might want to deliberately create a Condorcet cycle so that border will be applied. But the problem is that uh, that that kind of manip you, we can't rule out all manipulations. Uh, that kind of manipulation uh, 
um, in a in the sense that I've been talking about is is less likely to be valuable than the manipulations available for other voting rolls. So, so the, the remaining set of U's for which you don't manipulate, it's smaller when you do the combined Condorcet and Borda than if you do only Borda. That's right. Okay. That's right. Thanks. Sorry, I just have a quick question about yep. dominating things by two different yep. rules. Here it uh, is. I, I thought the name of the game is that we don't we don't know what the I, I guess it's related to his we, we don't know what the set of utility profiles is. Right? That's that's right. We so don't. it's true that we have either this or that, but which one are we gonna do? Well we're going to try to do both as, as much as we can, which uh, which is what black tries to do. Black Black says we, we elect the Condorcet winner if there is a Condorcet winner, and otherwise we use Borda. Now, that's not, that doesn't perfectly correspond to Theorem 2, but it, it, it's as close as we can come to, to Theorem 2. But that's one voting rule, is it? I mean, it, it, then I interpret yes. that as one vo voting rule. I, I, guess that, I guess that was his question, whether that rule would then be manipulable, right? Of course it's manipulable, but, so but it's, it's less manipulable mm -hmm. than any other. Well, it, That's a corollary so, of what you've proved, I guess. Yeah. That's right. Thanks. We have time for one to, more question. Thank you. To those of us who have the right to vote in the United Kingdom, which I'm not sure there are any in this room, but would you recommend to vote yes or no in the upcoming referendum, yeah. which I believe proposes to abolish the first past the post? Yeah system in favor of something that kind of resembles the rank order on a constituent level or not quite? Yeah. Uh, all right. So, so uh, there's going to be a, a referendum next month in, 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 in the UK on replacing plurality rule, first past the post, uh, with it's not actually rank. It, it, it comes closer to uh, it, it comes closest to runoff voting. It's, a, it's actually what's in this country called instant runoff voting, where uh, people, uh, voters rank the candidates, and we first eliminate the candidate who is uh, top ranked the least often, and then we keep on eliminating the remaining candidates in that way until we come up with a unique winner. So the, the, that, that, that's, uh, the, of the voting rules I've talked about, that's the closest to what's used in France, the runoff voting in France. Uh, now, that's not majority rule, and it's not rank order voting. Uh, so theorems one and two don't apply. Um, I actually w was asked exactly that question in the, in the UK not long ago, and I said that, that on, on balance I, I am in favor of, of the switch because although runoff voting is not as good as, as what we get in Theorem 2, it is better than plurality rule. Plurality rule, it's ironic, plurality rule is, is probably the most widespread rule and practice, and it really is quite terrible, <laughs> theoretically. So, so moving to instant runoff voting, uh, uh, or alternative voting as it's called in, in Britain, uh, would, would on balance be an, an improvement. Yeah. Yeah. As you probably know, there's a reception at the castle, free food and drinks. I know that everyone is looking forward to that, but <laughs> just let me thank um, Professor Maskin on behalf of the Graduate Economics Association for coming. Before delivering this lecture, he had lunch with students, he had the office hours. I really th believe this is the best way to honor the memory of Professor Rosenthal. I also want to thank Norma for organizing this lecture and all the people, all the professors and students who came, attended this lecture and made this event a success. Thank you very much. <laughs>